Welcome, welcome if you're back for the first time I, after this last year. Welcome if you're here for the first time in the building. Should we have a round of applause for everyone that's here for the first time? Or come back. It's cool. So. I fell in a ditch the other day. I fell in a ditch. So I was cycling back from the church where I work. And um, I was on my bike. Um, my new new old bike and I was cycling I decided that I would cycle down a new way not the way that I would usually cycle I usually go along the main road and this time I went down a way that looked a bit darker and I thought yeah I'm gonna go this way and I went around the shore and through some bushier areas and um, came towards this gate there was actually like a, what you call a kissing gate I suppose not that much kissing was going on there. And I, my wife wasn't with me. I wasn't giving her a backy. And so I lifted my bike off over the gate and I carried on cycling. And then this path started getting narrower and narrower. The bushes and the hedges were getting bigger and bigger and the brambles were getting bigger. And I went over about four different gates. And by this time I was thinking, this was a bad decision. I've gone the wrong way. So I cycled and I, but I decided that I'd carry on cycling nonetheless. And so I was cycling down this path that was getting quite precarious at this point and came round at a corner and ever so slowly, with nothing to hold on, just slowly fell sideways into a ditch. I landed on my back on top of my laptop, which is actually owned by the church. I didn't break it, thankfully. I went crashing through a load of brambles, and it was my, I was actually wearing shorts and a t-shirt, and I am bald, as you can see. And so everywhere was ringing. It did occur to me, at the bottom of this pit, I, that there were two things, two forces, that collided to make me in my current position. The first one was that there was a farmer that hadn't cut the bush, right? If the farmer had gone through, sorry if heaven's here, and cut this bush back, I wouldn't have ended in that ditch. But then I also realised that it was probably my fault and I ended up in the ditch, much to my own fault. This is a picture of the ditch that I fell in. I was that angry that I decided to take a photo of it. Sometimes I just take it out at times in the middle of the night and just glare at it. That's where I ended up. You see, if the way home isn't clear, people will end up in ditches, don't they? Let's get up the first verse. This is um, in Psalms, and it says this. Let's have a quick look at that, if that's possible. So Psalms 42. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure you know that Jesus is in the business of pulling people out of pits and maybe you feel like you're in a pit today and maybe you feel like you're here and you are in a miry bog well Jesus is in the in the business of pulling people out of pits you know what his church partners with him in pulling him out of the ditch and his church is the bride of Christ and I tell you what maybe if my wife was there with me that day when I fell on the bike I wouldn't have fallen in a ditch because she's very wise and would have told me not to go down that direction. But I ended up in the ditch nonetheless. You know, Jesus talks, and there's a few different stories in the New Testament where Jesus is talking about, talking to the hypocrites, to the Pharisees. And these Pharisees had this constant debate going on with Jesus about various things, but particularly around the Sabbath. And they would, they would say, so is it okay to work on the Sabbath? I noticed that you healed that guy with the withered hands. Is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? Nonetheless, he heals this guy with a withered hand. There was another occasion where there was a guy with dropsy and Jesus is at the Pharisee's house having, having dinner and they're getting him there just so they can stitch him up, just so they can, they can have something to bring against him. And all of a sudden, this man with dropsy appears in front of him. This dropsy, it means like a swelling of the legs caused by kidney failure or, or something of that case and this guy appears in front of him this is a desperate man 
a dinner table just appears in front of Jesus. And what does Jesus say? He says to all of them, is it okay to, to work on the Sabbath, to heal on the Sabbath? And they're kind of glaring at him and he heals this guy nonetheless because Jesus is in the business of pulling people out of ditches that we fall into, out of the brambles of sin that entangle us, out of the sting of death. And I tell you what, when I was... A couple of days after getting out of this ditch, my skin was still ringing, throbbing. There was this one time, actually, where me and my cousins, and I don't know if I should share this story, but me and my cousins and my brother, we were at a church conference called Stonely. Anyone been to Stonely? Rock on! Yeah. We went to Stonely, the uh, church conference, and um, we were out with our mates, and one of our friends a girl called Claire, and I'm really sorry about this, Claire, if you do happen to see this, <laughs> fell in the ditch full of stinging nettles. And because we were so gallant, and because we'd heard these Christian stories through the week, faith building, telling us to pull people out of ditches, we ran off and we left Claire in the ditch. <laughs> Terrible. Jesus is in the business of pulling people in, out of ditches. Yeah. And he needs the church to partner with him in that business. And it's as simple as that. You know, Nehemiah, when he was going around the walls, he went out through the valley gates. And when he went out through the valley gate, the interesting thing is that he would have, at that point, on the left, he would have seen the broken down walls of Jerusalem. And on the right, he would have seen the destruction and the destroyed houses of Israel and even further back from that he would have seen the completely destroyed broad gate that he wasn't even going to bother trying to build because they'd lost so much ground and he traveled around he went down to the dung gate and back up to the fountain gate back round again and up to the valley gate and went back in and it's at this point that he went and he shared this passage. This is him talking in Nehemiah. He goes and he talks to all the Israelites and he says to them, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in? How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned? He's, he's perplexed. He's been around the walls. He's seen that they're eroded and destroyed. Do you know that there's a bunch of talented people in, the, in um, Israel at that point? But they were living with destroyed walls. Walls are there for your protection. But they were living in a time with broken down walls. The house of God, the temple that was in the center of those walls was unprotected. That His people were unprotected. But they were talented people living there. There were goldsmiths. There were, they were perfumers. There were some gifted people. But they weren't using it to build the walls. Come, let us build the walls of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Maybe we need to strengthen our hands for the good work of building the kingdom of God and his church. Because you know what? Jesus loves his church. He loves his church. I love my wife. And I don't like people criticizing my wife. And I reckon Jesus loves his bride and doesn't like people criticizing his bride. Don't you reckon? Let us rise up and build so they strengthen their hands for the good work. But when Sambala and the Horonite and Tobiah, the Ammonite, servant and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper. And we as servants will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. The enemy has no place. Then Elisha, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests. And they built the sheep gate. Do you know that we are the priests of all believers? We need to rise up. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built, and next to them, Zachar, the son of Imri, built. Matt asked me to talk around chapter three, and when I looked in chapter three, I thought, what on earth have you given me? 
There's not much going on there. That's why I started in chapter two. But chapter three actually is an amazing passage for us. You probably get to that bit and you skip through. There's just a load of names. But for Israelites, genealogies are really important. It reminded them of who was there. It reminded them of what their family had done. And if they could trace their genealogy back, they can say, hey, my dad was there. He built that wall. My granddad was there. My great grandfather grandmother was there. And the family built together. The title of the message today is Rebuild the Gateways to Church. Rebuild the Gateways to Church. This, this arise word, let's have a quick look at that. This arise word. Word is this. This is on the next slate, hopefully. Arise means to arise, rise, get up, stand up, endure, belong to, stay fixed. That's what it means. You know, we are all these people in here, the people that give their lives to Jesus. All we are is people that have got out of a pit, taken Jesus' hand, and it's decided to stand up. But we've got to keep on standing up. I was watching this story, the, um, this program the other day about the Aztec buildings. Now, these Aztec buildings are cool, but there's not many of them because what happened is when their entire civilization, civilization was destroyed, the Spanish used their stones to build churches. You know, Jesus, he talks about us being like living stones. And Tobiah, later in chapter 4, one of the enemies of Israel, he attacked the Israelites and he was saying, hey, how are you going to build these, this temple? How are you going to build these walls, you feeble Israelites? Stones that are broken. Are you going to revive these stones that have been burned by fire? That sounds a lot like a revival statement, doesn't it? Are you going to revive? You no, know, Jesus talks to us about us being like living stones built upon Jesus Christ as the cornerstone and as we fit together next to our brothers and sisters and as we arise together we build you know this brick has been made of a purpose but it's never going to fulfill its full purpose until it is slotted alongside other bricks until it rises up and those Aztec buildings there's not much left of that civilization but you know what I love, I love history and I love seeing that sort of thing, but that was a bad civilization. They would sacrifice children on, on the bricks of those walls. And, you know, we're not much better ourselves, are we, really, in this, in this culture? You know, Afghanistan isn't the worst place to live in this world. The worst ways to live in this world is in a mother's womb. It's probably the most dangerous place to live. But the amazing thing is that the grace of Jesus has come and God, as even though we are, desire, we are deserving of wrath, Jesus has come into this world, reached down and he can pull any sinner back from the brink, can't he? He's good. So here, this is, this is actually um, one of the gates. This is the Damascus gate. These gates were built large because the center of the community was around these gates. Gates were very important in ancient Israel. Community would have happened there. You know, decrees would have happened there. The elders would have met there. To control gates of a city is to control a people. So here, are, here is 10 ways, 10 ways that we can rebuild the gates of the church according to the 10 gates of Jerusalem, and we're probably gonna to have to be a bit further, a bit quicker here, because I spent about 15 minutes on the introduction. But here's the first one, the sheep gate. The sheep gate is the first gate. And then what you see in, what you see in Nehemiah 3 is that they go around all of the gates counterclockwise, and the top one would have been the sheep gate. The sheep gate, make your way home. The sheep gate was all about all about where they would drive the sheep and the lambs through the gate towards the temple, the house of God. And these sheep, these lambs, were the sacrifice. Do you know that Jesus is the gate? Jesus is the gate. He is the lamb 
who died and was sacrificed for our mistakes and our sins so that they wouldn't have to drive sheep through the gates any longer because we have one perfect and spotless lamb and his name is Jesus Christ. And no matter how far away from Jesus you feel today and no matter how much of a mess, if you were to accept him, if you would give your life to Jesus today, he will take all of your mess and all of your sin and all of our deserving of wrath and turn it back and we receive the grace of God. And that is good news. The second is this, the fish gate. The fish gate. Make the house smell like fish. Make the house smell like fish. This is the house of God. Us together. You know, the house of God, people of God, we're not a building, we're a people. We are living stones. But we've got to make the house smell like fish. You know, there's this old saying by pastors, they say, smell like the sheep. Well, maybe we need to smell like fish as well. This is a very fishy smelling church, I think, most of the time. We have new Christians in here all the time. You know, the thing about the fish gate is that the fish was brought from Galilee into the temple through the fish gate. And Jesus said to his disciples, his first disciples at Galilee, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And we need to be fishers of men. That's why we are a soul-saving church. That's why we do the gospel every week, because we want the house to smell like fish. It's a fishy place. The next one is the old gate. Make room for generations. We are all about the different generations in this church. We believe in the different generations. We believe in the older generations and the younger generations. The reason that this place is quite dark and the reason that the music is louder, sometimes it can be a little bit too loud, but the reason it is loud and we push in that direction and the reason it's dark and whenever I show New people around this church, this is, this is what I say, is that it's very purposeful because I want your kids and your youth yeah. and I want my kids and my young people to love church. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? We have some incredible seniors in our church, Woo! incredible people. Yeah. We do. Yeah. Who would rather be singing Wesleyan hymns, yeah. I'm sure. And probably they'd be more theological. <laughs> but they put up with darkness <laughs> and the smell of fish so that your young people and my young people can love church because we want them to love Jesus, but we want him to love his bride as well. Yeah. Don't we? Yeah. When Nehemiah would have come out of, not the old gate, but the valley gate, which is the next one, I said he will see he would see the destroyed building. So the next one is the valley gate. Make way from the shadow of death. You know the thing about the enemy is and that we do have an, an, an enemy, his name is the devil. And the thing about the enemy is that he likes to shout. The Bible it talks about him roaring like an angry lion. He goes around like an angry lion looking for someone to devour. But you know what I've noticed in my short journey as a Christian is that most of the time, you know, most of the time there's a massive roar and then nothing happens. Because it's not the lion that devours you, it's fear. Fear will devour you. God wants to build your life. He wants to build you. He wants you firm and secure. So the enemy will roar sometimes. Sometimes the worst time in my life, the worst times have been instantly preceded by the best times because maybe the enemy likes to attack just before something incredible happens. And we've had quite an attack, but who knows? Maybe this is time where this church can be full of sheep and full of fish. Don't you believe it? Yeah. yeah? The next one is the dung gate. Right down the bottom of Jerusalem is the dung gate. And make sure you bring a shovel. We are an amazing church, but we're not a perfect church. We're not perfect. We're pretty close to being perfect. Matt's a perfect senior pastor. We're pretty close to being perfect, but we're not a perfect church. You know, Augustine talked about it, the church being like a hospital. And um, if you hang around here long enough, you probably have reason to leave. But don't. 
But don't. This is an amazing church. And it's as good as any to take your roots and let your roots go down deep. But sometimes hanging out with hurting people and people that are getting out of ditches, sometimes someone puts their hand on your shoulder and pulls you back into the ditch. But Jesus is there and your church is there to pull you back out. Don't give up on the church. Bring a shovel. You know, there's these two characters called Joshua and Caleb and it was said about them that they had a different spirit. And that word spirit, it could also mean breath. So they had a different breath. Don't have spiritual halitosis. Sometimes in the church, there can be more the smell of gossip, more the smell of slander, more the smell of criticism than the smell of sheep and fish. Don't have spiritual halitosis. The next one is this, the fountain gate. Make way for the spirit. Make way for the spirit. We have the Holy Spirit in this place. The Holy Spirit, who wants to come and fill us up. Let's look, let's look at the verse that's along from that, if possible, on the next slate. John 4, 14. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. And this is Jesus talking to the woman at the well. The woman at the well, and she's gone there to bring water up out of this pit. But really, she was there so Jesus could bring her out of a pit. And he said to her, Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, willing up to eternal life. That gate was called the spring and the fountain gate because there was a fountain that came through from outside of the gates. They blocked it off so that the enemies couldn't use it. But this spring, this fountain was inactive because the gates were destroyed and burned. But there were people going around the whole of chapter 3, and you can read it later, that arise together. It says that they were next to each other, generations and families. That there was one group, there's a man who was, doing, who was rising and building with his daughters. It's something that probably daughters wouldn't have done in that time, but he was building because everyone saw that it was important to rebuild the gates and we need to rebuild the gates of the church the next one is this the water gate the water gate make the word of god your medicine this is this is fiercely practical today okay make the word of god your medicine there was a time during lockdown where i was really looking back at it i was probably struggling with anxiety and so what i did was i realized i needed to get healthy so I put a load of verses, particularly to do with my situation, on my phone in a little um, notes area, and I called it my medicine cupboard. And whenever I was feeling particularly heavy or overwhelmed with things, I would sneak off somewhere, and I would go through my medicine cupboards, I'd look for the right medicine, and I'd take my pills. Yeah. Say to the person next to you, take your pills. Take your pills. Take your pills. Make the word of God your medicine. I love the story about George Whitfield. So George Whitfield and John and Charles Wesley, I mentioned them earlier, but they were in this thing called the Holy Club. They were in, in Cambridge together, and they made the Holy Club. And the whole point of this club was them to come together and practice being really good and Christians and go and feed people. They were incredible people. Anyone who saw them would have thought, these are Christians, but each one of them didn't believe that they were saved. Each one of them thought, because you know what, you can build things, you can hear the cry of the world, but you can forget the call of God, and you can be building over there, but you know what, the only kingdom that's ever going to survive in the end is the kingdom of God, and the walls of Jerusalem, they represent, and the Jerusalem represents his church, his church, because... In the end, the only thing that's going to survive is going to be Jesus' church. The only kingdom that's going to survive is going to be the kingdom of God. So we need to make a way so that us and others can get through the gates into the walls of protection. These great high walls protected by the almighty God. So that we can be protected and others can come into the walls of protection. We need to rebuild the gates of the church. We need to rebuild the gates of the church. And George Whitfield when he'd found Jesus. 
He would go and preach to thousands. One, a few times he preached to 50,000 people out on a field. Young people, that should make you excited. Yeah. Like, that's cool, isn't it? Yeah. Preached to 50,000 people out on a hilltop. In fact, I was reading one week from his life, and each day he preached to 50,000, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000. Apparently, at the end of the week, he wasn't exhausted. He had energy, because I, I suppose Jesus said... My food is to do the will of the Father. And so George was full up. And when he went and preached into a certain area where there was coal mining community, and these people were forgotten and alone, and there wasn't a church there because no one had bothered building one. George Whitfield appeared on a field, preached to them, and he said, you could see the tears streaming down their coal sooty faces because they were giving their lives to Christ. These are people whose hearts have been scolded and, and burdened, but they've given their lives over to Jesus in that moment. Maybe the water is the tears that comes from our hearts where the word of God penetrates and pierces the double-edged sword, cuts through our hearts so that the Holy Spirit can run in because it's the word and the spirit, isn't it? The next one is the horse gate. And the horse gate is where you need to get ready for battle. We are in a battle. Jesus has won the victory. He has won the battle in the end. But we are in a battle. Let's look at the Ephesians passage that's after it. <clears throat> Ephesians 6, 11 to 12. Put on the whole armour of God. Guys, put on the full armour of God. When my kids go to school in the morning, because I'm subtly teaching them how to do spiritual warfare and they don't know it yet, I get them to stand in front of me and I say to Olivia, who was nervous about going to the nursery the other day, where's your helmet of salvation? Where's your breastplate of righteousness? Where's your belt of truth? Where's your shoes of the gospel of peace? Put them on. Put peace on. Put the gospel of peace on. Where's your shield of faith? No, lift it higher. Yeah, okay, I'll lift it higher. Where's your sword of the spirit? And then we stab each other and go, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah? that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Do you know, now that we know about gates being built large and then being all about where the elders would get together and they would plan things, where they would decide debates, where they would decree things. When Jesus was saying this, Jesus, it's no small thing. Jesus is saying, oh, hang on, go on to the, let's go on to the next passage. Let's go on to the next passage. Yeah. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The gates. There's heaven's gates and there's the enemy's gates. And when Jesus, when Jesus is saying this, this isn't a small thing. He's saying the devil's plans. The enemy's beliefs about your life. The enemy's decrees about your life to take you down will not stand. The, anything that the enemy will plan or do to try and destroy his church, none of it will work. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And then he says in the next verse, which I haven't given you, but he says it to Peter, and I tell you, you are Peter on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. We can have the keys of the kingdom to get into the kingdom of God where the house of God is. It used to be a temple and now it's a people. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Maybe you're feeling bound by sin today. Maybe you feel feeling stuck in a mess. Jesus can take you out. You know that Jesus is the keeper of the gate. Jesus is the keeper of the gate. And there's a guy called Shemaiah, and he was building the gate. But this guy was old, and he was actually a, a great, 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 great grandson of David. This guy should have been a king, but he was weak, and he hadn't kept the gate. Jesus 
keeps the gate. And when he died on the cross, he took all the keys to sin and death and he conquered it all and now we can go and be with him. But we've got to give our lives over to the keeper of the gate, haven't we? And the last gate is this, the inspection gate. The inspection gate, make sure you take your place. There were loads of people that were building and it starts with building at home to build this home. But there were loads of people that gathered together with different gift sets, at different places, with different motive, but a motive together, strengthen their hands to build together. We need you to take your place. The way for us to build the gates of the church is for us to build together. We can't do it alone. We need to do it together. And just like in Jerusalem in those days, there were gifted people, goldsmiths, talented people. Today, we have gifted people in this church. We have gifted graphic designers. We have gifted musicians. We've got gifted carpenters and, and tradesmen. We need you to take your place. When they were building the walls, they built next to their house. This needs to become deeply personal. Let's arise and build the gates of the church. We need to make straight paths for his people. Should we stand together? So at the end of the service, what we're gonna do is, um, Emma Mitchell is gonna be over by the connections desk. And if you've had a rise in your heart, you think, you know what? I have, I am a goldsmith. I'm a perfumer. I don't know where my gifts fit, but I know that God can use them. Over in the connections desk, Dan and Emma Mitchell are gonna be over there. They'd love to chat with you because we are a body of believers. We're not gonna be much of a, of a body if there's just a wall built and no gates. Come and build the gates. Come and build the gates together. This is the Lord calling us out today. Come and arise his people. Take, his, take your place among the people of God building his great church. Should we have a round of applause for the Lord?